thanks all for coming. So I'm Alexei. So I currently in Glasgow. So this is not Glasgow Chemistry Department. Uh, this is just the University of Glasgow. So Chemistry Department is a little bit old building. So we, uh, but relatively old as well. So it it, it fits the, the background. So I'm very grateful to Carlos for introduction, for invitation. So it reminds me, of, so I'm not, after, after him calling me brilliant scientist, I'm very, very worried because it reminds me, so I'm fond of swimming, so I, I swam when I, and uh, I was a swimmer, uh, and it was a competitive swimming, and I remember, uh, so it was during my ch childhood years when I did all this competitive swimming, uh, my parents, this is how my parents described me. So you were brilliant at warming up, but then you came less. So I'm very worried about, about so, so Carlos did excellent warming up, but I'm now wor wor worried what I need to compete here and, and do all this competitive swimming uh, right now. So I'll try my best and uh, see how it goes. So, right. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. So this is now on. Uh, so, uh, across my groups, so we work across uh, three topics, more or less. So, one of the topics, so it's now established, so we publish uh, quite a few papers now, so that's why it's a safe topic, even talking to the camera. And this is what I'm going to talk today, the, the talk of mostly uh, be dedicated by solid state electrocatalysts. So, uh, commonly, when we encounter electrocatalysts, they normally associated with molecular, molecular material. So it's a new, very interesting trend, and I will explain uh, how this trend uh, happens, so why solid state is actually much more interesting from electrocatalytic uh, perspective. So I still work quite a bit on porous solids, so I own a PET machine, so why not? So I do quite a bit of porous solids, so published a uh, couple of quite decent papers on CO2 uh, storage. So I genuinely believe in carbon capture and storage. I think this is a solution uh, to global climate change rather than saving or trying to live a still life, uh, uh, stop living. So I think we should do as scientists something that, and I think I'm, carbon capture and storage is a really potentially excellent idea. So uh, my group works also on CO2 reduction uh, as well. So, and finally, we work on thin <coughs> solid films. And because I had funding, uh, so technically it's thin solid films for electric catalytic applications. So, but my funding will run out, I think, at some point and then it will be just simply thin solid films. Uh, so we work quite a bit in thin solid films and I really hope one day Carlos will invite me again and I can give the presentation just purely on thin solid uh, films. But let's go ahead with solid state electrocatalyst. Uh, so just give a brief outline. So I think some of you may be not as uh, familiar with electrocatalytic water uh, splitting, so that's why I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, fundamentals, I'll put uh, a little bit perspective, so why it doesn't make sense at all to do it, doing it. Uh, so uh, I will show three very nice, at least from my perspective, uh, uh, case studies to how you can play a little bit with solid state electrocatalytic. And first example would be we will take molecular material and then turn it into some sort of uh, uh, solid state material. So uh, we will immobilize it. Uh, another uh, different way what you can do, and uh, so some materials show polymorphs. So for example, polymorphic transformation. So they have exactly the same composition, but different structures. So if you look at what well, polymorphism is the most famous and the most profitable if you work in drug discovery. So what we constantly do, we constantly patent more and more new polymorphs. So it's a very interesting uh, avenue to explore. So you have a uh, material, 
if you're exactly the same composition, but if you can drive the crystal structure a little bit in the different direction, to, then you can uh, actually find quite interesting things. And finally, and this is uh, fully attributed to uh, my uh, PhD students who were brilliant, uh, pointing this to me uh, several times because I just was uh, narrow focus and they, they really just uh, showed what you can use a physical stimulus. So you can use electric chemistry to drive uh, the hydrogen evolution reaction. So you can take the physical uh, methods and improve it. And this opens quite interesting avenue again to explore. And I hope I will try, or well, at least I will try to persuade you, but it is um, interesting. So uh, that's going to be a race. Very nice for topics. So as I said, I'm fond of swimming. So yes, here we go. We have a butterfly, a backstroke, a front stroke, and uh, the, the mm. uh, breaststroke. So let's start first of all uh, with the UK. Uh, so the UK is quite interesting case. So as you all know, uh, different governments announced different climate change emergencies. And what is very interesting is happening. So if you look at trends in renewable share of electricity generation, so they're generating electricity. So I should point out what UK has a uh, very interesting uh, concept. So they have uh, electrical to heat our water, kettles, so on and so forth. And it has gas. So the gas we use for heating our homes. And actually, electricity is not really substantial. It's quite minor uh, share of energy use in, <coughs> in the UK. So in a sense, this, this graph is a little bit of cheating. But it still looks very nice, because we see to have a uh, very sort of if not exponential, but at least sort of linear uh, steady growth in renewables. So what we currently have is about 33% of all electricity in the UK is generated by uh, renewables energy sources. And this includes solar, wind, uh, and hydro, uh, but doesn't include nuclear. So nuclear doesn't consider as, as renewable. So what is very interesting, so we are up by 20,000 megawatts each year. So, and it's a consistent, very steady trend. So for comparison, this is the UK. But if we talk about Scotland, so Glasgow is in Scotland. So the Scottish economy, so the electricity generated in Scotland is 88%. So effectively, if we continue the trend, which is very likely, so we, all electricity in Scotland will be produced from renewable energy. But this presents a challenge. So as you all know, renewable energy is intermittent. Intermittent means what when wind doesn't blow and sun doesn't shine, we can't use it. So the current solution is to store it in the grid and then to reuse it. But this is again, so this is you, as a consumer, you have limited control about it. And this is inconvenient for when you use intermittent energy. So the obvious solution to this is this. Um, and this is the price of uh, storing the renewable energy. And this is price is for batteries. So lithium ion storage batteries is in the, as we see the cost as the energy generation from uh, renewable energy rises practically exponentially, we have exponential decrease in cost of uh, lithium ion batteries. So it's inevitable what we will have the design of homes going to be very, very interesting in 10, 15 years. So we will have an, our individual energy generation whether it's wind or solar, and then you can store this extra capacity. 
So the problem I have with ventures is it's fantastically boring science. Is any, anybody working on ventures here? <laughs> Hopefully not. So the, the technology, battery technology has been developed uh, in 80s. There's nothing new to develop. So literally, we very, very, very few materials to work with. And uh, in all honesty, because we work with energy companies, companies that work with batteries, uh, so we definitely see what they are much, much more capable to find solution uh, rather than us as chemists. So there is very, very limited uh, interesting things what you can do. And as you see, the, most of this uh, is, the, is the challenge. Uh, so now it's uh, roughly the same in engineering problem. Uh, so it's better is it's more or less engineering problem. So for a chemist, uh, there's not so much to be done in chemistry. So in addition, uh, we should look ahead. So I think looking ahead is very important because uh, there is a certain element of risk uh, with new energy sources or new energy storage uh, capabilities because we don't know what would be effect. So once we will have, for example, everything stored or we have control of our energy, so there's a very famous effect, it's called rebound effect. So for example, if I have a car which consumes less uh, fuel, I'm going to drive more. So on average, I will uh, save money on fuel. Or alternatively, if I save money on fuel because I drive a uh, fuel-efficient car, but with all this extra money what I save from fuel, I'm going to take extra holidays to Spain, me personally. I don't know where you go. What it is. Probably you stay in Spain. So from this perspective, it's going to be even more. So Spain probably would be more environmentally friendly. So the bound effect is very strong. So there's also an unknown unknowns. I said. So with something what we don't know at all about batteries, maybe, and once you start having mass scale and you use them, something will turn up. But we don't know yet what it's going to be. And of course, given back control to achieve completely sustainable future, so you don't want fully rely on batteries. So what if it's going to be a company similar to Facebook or Google? So and it will be it will be impossible. So we will corner the market, and the price of battery will just go all over the for whatever reason. So uh, one of the solutions. There are many different solutions. So one of alternatives, I chosen it, what the electrolysis. So uh, I get very angry with my students when they draw this picture. I'll show you a little bit later. So the real water electrolysis system will look completely different. We don't look like this, two electrodes stuck in the, it's in the lab. So when my, my student tests the catalyst, of course, they look a little bit like this. But the genuine industrial electrocatalytic water system, looks, a water uh, oxidation and water reduction system, looks very different. So uh, it is very important to understand. So uh, electrolysis of water is quite unpractical. So what is done typically, you can either use the alkaline conditions, so very high pH, or you can use very low pH. So acidic conditions. So if you use acidic conditions to reduce hydrogen, so you just need to give an extra electron to proton, and in theory should uh, turn into uh, hydrogen. Very very simple. So again, effectively, if you, you work in alcohol, um, in acidic solutions, when you uh, heat very very or energy in order to evolve hydrogen. So your most of your energy consumption will go for uh, production of oxygen. Okay? So but this number is very nice. And that number is very nice because we can use for example a solar cell. 
So it's again a very, very primitive example. So the real devices will look drastically different, nothing like this. So it's a lot of peristaltic pumps which are pumping the water through. But in simplistic approach, we can attach our uh, solar cell and we can start uh, producing hydrogen in theory. And then we use this hydrogen uh, for whatever reason. Okay? But this is how the industrial cell looks like. So I stole this uh, cartoon uh, from the internet without acknowledgement. Uh, but there was no one to acknowledge, so that was quite convenient for me. So effectively, you have two a very, very interesting systems. So you have two metal plates, and you have the more or less porous electrodes with your catalyst, and then you pump in your reagents through, and then you collect your Sorry, you collect your hydrogen and oxygen separately. So it's a very, very simple and trivial uh, thing to do. So the problem is uh, if we use the solar cells, so for example, photovoltaics, then the current density you can achieve even from this quite sophisticated uh, cell is relatively low. So what does it mean from practical perspective? Uh, so, if we look uh, at the, so this is another schematic how the typical industrial electro, electrolyzer looks like. So we have a plate, and we have a porous uh, gas diffusion layer, so, so in normally it's uh, titanium, and you have your iridium catalyst or iridium oxide catalyst. Or you have your glassy carbon electrode, and it's uh, so it's uh, again porous, and you use your platinum uh, catalyst. So in order to achieve reasonable current density and achieve appreciable hydrogen evolution rates, you need a very very high surface area. That means you need a very very high consumption of your catalyst. So which brings us. Uh, brings an obvious issue. So if we use platinum or iridium oxide, so it's quite unpractical. So the obvious uh, attempt for a chemist is search for new chemical system, or at least try to understand if there's any sustainable uh, alternatives to these two brilliant uh, elements, so iridium and platinum. Okay, so what is very important to mention here, so as I already said, the hydrogen evolution cat uh, catalytic reaction doesn't, in theory, require any energy, but this is in theory. So what in practice we have is the two, uh, it's a surface effect, so the hydrogen needs to absorb on the surface, or protons needs to be absorbed on the surface of a catalyst and they need to recombine somehow to the molecules and they need to dissolve uh, from the uh, catalyst. And this is uh, reflected in uh, this value which is called over P over P which is over potential. So it's an extra, an extra potential you need to give in order to uh, drive your hydrogen evolution reactions. So we goal is to minimize this value as much as possible. So if you bring it to zero, so you can very nicely to produce. Plus you have this IR, so this is a resistance. So again, this is, gives you an extra message in design of your catalyst. So you want something what is conducted. And so the beautiful thing about uh, hydrogen evolution reactions and what we see this evolution of hydrogen evolution uh, starts in uh, late uh, uh, notice, so the late uh, 2005, 2006. And the reason is because we have more and more uh, computational power. So more and more people start calculating the hydrogen evolution. And what you can do, you can calculate very easily the free energy of absorption 
of hydrogen from different metals, metal catalysts. And uh, what you see is this free energy of absorption is directly correlated with current density. So the correlation with current density gives you the indicator what's going to happen. So you can put an extra layer of complexity as your computational power grows. You can add, for example, uh, you can look not on platinum as platinum per se, you can look at specific uh, layers in platinum and so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting trend, but what's happened is what you have a, a so-called uh, burst of uh, blockbuster material, so it's a burst of abundant material, and it's uh, what is very interesting, it's coincided with the graphene. So the graphene arose around 2005-2006, and quite randomly, people start very actively calculate molybdenum sulfide, and if you calculate hard enough, then you probably demonstrate that it's a very good catalyst. So there's, there's enough effort and trials and errors, so the molybdenum sulfide was proven to be an absolutely blockbuster catalyst. Uh, for whatever reason it was at that time. So, and this trend kind of continues to uh, nowadays. And uh, from this perspective, you have uh, some sort of uh, benchmark. Uh, so what was very interesting in the show about 2D materials in general. So as we know, 2D materials were very anisotropic. So you have uh, uh, edges and you have terrace sites. And uh, at that time, what we've done, so the uh, Jeremias group in particular, uh, so they took a, a STM image, so they just deposited molybdenum sulfide uh, nanoflakes, so crystals, and they took a range of uh, STM images, so you can calculate very exactly how much edges you have, and then compare with the surface, and then you can grow small, large, medium size, and very large. And then you compare what's going to happen. And what they very, very convincingly, so this is absolutely a big paper, so everyone signs it, so for, for absolutely uh, good reason, is what they just are substantially more catalytically active in, uh, in case of two dimensional materials. Uh, so, and this has a dramatic effect when you design your electrocatalyst. So the typical approach, if you read the papers on electrocatalyst, nano is good. So we should do go nano. And this is a very reasonable approach because if we compare this over potential, so the metrics, so in bulk, the molybdenum sulfide will show you 700 millivolts rubbish. Uh, but when it reduces, almost three times. So you can improve it uh, quite substantially. So uh, there are different ways of um, doing it. Is you can dock, you can nanostructure. So basically you induce as many defects uh, as possible. So that's the strategy when I started in, uh, in Glasgow. So we took this strategy, so we did, uh, so we published a couple of uh, nice papers, but I found it's extremely boring because there was a little bit shake and bake, so you, you shake it and you hope there will be less. So we use a lot of hydrothermal uh, chemistry, not what hydrothermal uh, chemistry is bad per se, but it was a little bit uh, non-scientific from our perspective. So uh, the work was, uh, uh, we decided to talk to chemists uh, and uh, brilliant chemist in uh, classical chemistry, so Harry Mirrors. And our idea was, can we mimic the edges? And they work into in polyoxide uh, chalcogonides. So his original background in polyoxide metalloids. Uh, so when he used to work with the chronin, as you might know, in some of you. And so, but now he's on his independent career, so he's a senior lecturer in Glasgow. 
So they look at the edges in molybdenum sulfide, and my question to Harry was, can we mimic them, just do exactly the same, but as molecules? So what happens if we we'll just take them? He said, yeah, sure, we can do this. Is, this is Harry. And, but what's happened next, he comes back to me, no, we probably we need to give a little bit of extra oxygen there. Okay, that's fine, we still have plenty of, of edges here, so it's very, very interesting to explore. And these are dimetallic anions, so we can, so when we designed this project, so we thought molybdenum, molybdenum, then tungsten, tungsten, and then you have also molybdenum, tungsten. So what is beautiful about, or in theory, what is beautiful about molecular materials, you can effectively say what you can design wherever you, you want. So at least this is what we wrote in our proposal. So uh, we got some funding, and what start happening, they start making the stuff. And what it turns out, so we can easily make this one, uh, but then it's went a little bit sideways, so we get a little bit polysulfide effect. Uh, still very interesting three uh, model compounds. So all three of them have this edge. So we can really try and compare and see what's going to happen. And so what is great about these molecular materials is what you can precipitate them very, very quickly and they just crush us. And what we can do, we can make them on electrons. So they make fantastic film uh, with not fantastic, by, by, fanta by thin film standards, so they're not smooth, but they, they, they just grow. So it's a sort of self-assembly on our electrodes, so you can test them very easily. And this is what you do, so what you typically do, you, uh, you do uh, so-called cyclic voltammetry scans, and then uh, you can also uh, attach a D GC, and then you look at the uh, hydrogen evolution. So you play a little bit with catalyst volume. So, but what was very interesting about it, so these two materials, despite having, uh, this one had a, this uh, polysulfide tail here, so they perform practically the same. So I think I should have plotted it differently on the same graph, but it doesn't matter. So if you see, they basically spot on. So they really, really, really the similar performance. And that was very exciting, while the tungsten didn't perform good at all. So molybdenum and tungsten are pretty much the same. So at that time, when we started, we went the tungsten, so tungsten must be rubbish, molybdenum must be very good. And uh, so at 10 uh, milliampere per centimeters, and this is our published data, on cobalt or molybdenum sulfide. So they outperform substantially the uh, molybdenum sulfide. So we hardly get any current densities on molybdenum sulfide. So our over potential at 10 million pairs would be about 260. Well, here we're talking about 110. So we substantially improve. And it's very easy to make, so it's a molecular material, so you precipitate it on the surface. But for me, what exciting was not just another very good electric catalyst, it's this uh, phenomena, why they uh, sort of behave in exactly the same. And so what is interesting, there's a lot of theoretical calculations, and you can do this. And we started working with Carl's ball, uh, and so Carl's ball. And it's just to give you a rough idea of what's happening or during the hydrogen evolution. So first you give an electron to proton, and the proton gets absorbed on the surface. Then what could happen if you have an extra uh, electron donation, it will can recombine the proton with hydrogen, and you have hydrogen evolution. And this is called Wallmerkerowski mechanism. So uh, alternatively, what you can have, so you have hydrogen absorption, and then additionally, another hydrogen get absorbed, and they migrate. And then they recombine by migrating at the surface. And this is different mechanism. So what's brilliant about this uh, electric chemistry 
is by measuring, the, uh, uh, by plotting your lower potential versus the logarithm of current density, you can have the curves which will indicate which is rate limiting stage. And what we see, these are absolutely identical. So they just spot on, so they have absolutely exactly the same uh, kinetics of reaction, but the tungsten uh, is very, very, very different. So why is it so? Why do they show identical performance? And this is what we did with Kals and uh, and Hunda Badeva. Uh, so he's in bio I see in Lisbon. And so they calculated and what is happening. So what the hydrogen is get up so exactly on this edge side. While in case of tungsten, so we have it on polysulfide edge. And that's why you have such a drastic performance. And when I was preparing this presentation, so much computational power, so much work went into this, and it's just summarized in one single slide, which is a little bit crazy uh, with all the computational uh, studies. So this is very, very So right now, obviously, the outlook for this work, so we're designing more and more, so we're trying uh, um, uh, selenium, we try to make the analog, the tungsten analog, so we can really develop this project. It's a very, very interesting project uh, uh, to, to work at. And uh, so this is one example of how we can uh, target the electrochemical performance. The second strategy I would like to present is, uh, so it's, it's more a rhetorical question. Does it make sense to use edges in two-dimensional materials? Because two-dimensional materials, by definition, uh, have very little edges, but a lot of terraces. So I view it's a little bit like um, rice paddies. So if you've been to East Asia, so you have these uh, paddies. And I guess you didn't see much rice uh, grown at the edges. <laughs> so the rice predominantly is grown on the butter <coughs> plants. So the two-dimensional materials will look very much the same. So you have a lot of planes, but you have very little edges. So it seems to be kind of, kind of counterintuitive. If you work with two-dimensional materials, you just try to destroy their two-dimensionality in order to make them good electric catalysts. To me, it didn't make sense, so I, I, I kind of rebelled uh, against this. So, to my opinion, that's not the right choice. And what we were very interested to do, and again, uh, it's great because electrocatalytic uh, water splitting is a trendy field. So there's a lot of theoretical calculations. And if you look at the theory, so in this rec relatively recent paper, so there's a huge bunch of them, and it's already calculated for you which one to pick. But when you see experimental work, and there's one. <laughs> so there's one, and because it's molybdenum sulfide, and so you can turn uh, the semiconductor molybdenum sulfide into metallic molybdenum sulfide. But you do it in a little bit uh, complex way, so you need to intercalate lithium with notoriously, famously known uh, beauty of lithium, which caused a lot of damage to science in 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 US. So there was this classical accident is building. Uh, so not exactly something you really want to work in your lab without uh, glove box. Well we have glove box, so the work is building in the glove box. Uh, but my biggest issue was not the, the chemical not instrumentation, not methodology, because we're chemists and we do it all the time anyway. So once you intercalate lithium, you do a lot of damage to your material. So we didn't really, so before I was completely unconvinced whether the improvement was due to nanostructure or the improvement was through genuine switch of uh, crystal structure. So 
what we try to do is to take and look into alternatives and alternatives we find uh, molybdenum telluride. So what is great about molybdenum telluride, and especially DFT already predicted what it should be a great electric catalyst, so again, uh, is what we can play with, with these two structures without any need for chemical intervention. So all you need is a furnace to make a metallic phase. So we made it at 900 degrees in a sealed dump fields directly from the elements. Uh, so it's kind of like the hydro distorted uh, uh, distorted octahedra as base units of the structure. And then what you can do is simply take this metallic phase and heat it to 700 degrees and it turns into semiconductor. So you can do isomorphic uh, transformation. And this is what we did. So we isomorphically converted and the structure was absolutely identical. Microstructure was absolutely identical. And what we really see is a huge difference between metal and semiconductor. So uh, for me, it was very, very important to prove what by playing with crystal structure and by playing with the uh, properties of a material, you can really turn and uh, show genuine uh, change in electrocatalytic performance. So, uh, in a sense, we confirmed what uh, the metallic phase is a uh, genuinely uh, better catalyst. And of course, the, the biggest challenge with uh, catalyst is once you, you, you operate in extremely uh, corrosive conditions. And uh, it's very important nowadays to demonstrate what we actually survive. And what we normally do, we have the electrode and we can do in situ characterization. So it's the scan and demonstrate before and after. And it just uh, shows. But uh, this is just an example of metallic and semiconducting, so a little bit of microstructure. So the microstructure uh, practically uh, retained. So there's a little bit more blurry images. The reason why they're more blurry, because it's a semiconducting phase. So your SEM sees it less conductive, so we didn't cover this goal on purpose. And so this was again measured directly on the electrode. So they try uh, literally not to manipulate. So similar particle morphology, different polymorphs. Okay? And then they show completely different uh, 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 kinetics of reaction. So here the red limited state is desorption of hydrogen. So it wants to stick to the surface. While in uh, this case, so just from the uh, from the swap, uh, it's the adsorption, so it doesn't stick to electrons. So they're very, very principally uh, different uh, materials. But what is very interesting, so by changing the crystal structure, you can uh, obviously change quite a bit. And they're also obviously different in terms of uh, one is metal, the other. So this is change transfer resistance, which could be a good approximation about conductivity. Approximation. So, uh, and stability, so you run it for continuous CV cycling, so you can do many, many cycles, and then you see. But what was very interesting, so we say that uh, stable, so there's nothing change, but my students were not really convinced, and they said, well, you see, after 1,000 cycles, it's kind of getting better. I said, no, maybe it's just a rare error of the me measurements. And what they, uh, they tried a lot, uh, so they reproduced, but we couldn't see it uh, within the error. So our proposal was, uh, so what about we nano make it nanocrystalline? But not by nanocrystalline, uh, so they will take the metallic phase and turn it into crystalline, uh, so we will have higher surface area. So we improve our sensitivity. 
and when uh, they nano crystallize it, so it slightly improves the uh, performance. So the current density improves, but this is what you expect. You have high surface area, you have more reactive size. This is normal. But when they start uh, cycling this material, and what we've seen is a massive, dramatic improvement in capability to produce hydrogen and uh, capability. So the potential dropped absolutely dramatically. But for me, what was really cool is what when you turn it off, it reverts back to your 320 uh, uh, millivolts of a potential. So turn it on, turn it off, and it just continue working. So which brought us to this third strategy. So what can, how we can play this 2D materials is with physical stimulus. And so just again this graph, so you turn it on, turn it off. And uh, very important, so there's a lot of effects. Uh, so cyclic voltammetry is not state to state, especially reducing, there's a lot of effects happening. Uh, and it's very important to measure it in a steady state. And this is, for example, you apply the stable potential, and then you see how your current density changes. And the current density genuinely changes, so it improves, so the material improves. And what we also did, so you would expect your hydrogen evolution to go down, so materials typically will be steady or once you start producing more hydrogen, your gas cell will leak a little bit. But what's happening is quite an interesting thing. So you're producing more hydrogen. As you cycle it, you're producing more and more hydrogen. So this material is getting self-optimized. OK? And so we obviously thought oh, there must be some structural transformation. And so we uh, did again in situ. So XRD uh, and in situ uh, Raman and there's the children in Raman. So uh, when they look, maybe there's some morphology change. Morphology is the same. But uh, it was already quite clear because it's reversed back. Because if you had morphology change or composition change, it wouldn't come back. So it was quite clear for us there was some uh, very unusual uh, electronic effects. So, no changes in structure, no changes in morphology, no changes in composition. Uh, so, uh, what could it be? So, we tried also to look at so called electrochemical uh, surface area. Maybe we have some surface area, maybe something materials start breathing. And again, they're just identical, they're just the same. The only thing what changed is the impedance, the cross copy. So it's getting a little bit more conductive. Or we, we can claim it's getting more conductive. So you have an easier charge transfer uh, towards your surface. So after thinking about it, so we came with uh, electrochemical activation idea. So we look at the, uh, very, very, this is very primitive band structure, so we have uh, also, it's all calculated, but it's just this very nice cartoon. And what it did, so we have half filled uh, band, and that means this material can accumulate more, uh, more electrons. So once we pump in these electrons effectively into our materials, we change. So this is proposal. So we, 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 so we review us sort of happy at the moment, so we just brushing it up uh, at very. So our speculation is adsorption of hydrogen uh, on the surface also results in optimization of a uh, crystal structure. So we lifting up a little bit the uh, Fermi level. So this is a lot of work in progress, so we have uh, uh, synchrotron time for exhaust measurements. So we will have in situ measurement. They they will do 
and see what's going to happen. So we will pour a lot of in situ and in a perando uh, measurements. So we also did the DFT calculations to see what the effect of hydrogen absorption. So when hydrogen absorbs on the surface, uh, so uh, what's happening, so if the bonds, instead of being, uh, so we have a shortening of the bonds, at least in theory. Again, this is what our calculation showed. So the bonds are getting shorter, and this may cause us some uh, dynamic structure uh, change. And it also, you can calculate and you will find the, there's the optimal surface coverage. So that means, that's the reason when it stops. So it's not goes activated into infinity. So you keep cycling, but it stays at the same level potential. So it reaches a specific uh, minimum. Okay? So, as I mentioned, the proposal, as hydrogen absorbs, we have change in electronic structure. We don't know yet what kind of electronic structure, but this is our future work and output. So, uh, uh, one of the reviewers' concerns, so that's the final slide, nearly there. Uh, so one of the reviewers' concerns was like, why is it so slow? So you claim electronic structure, why is it slow? And they were absolutely correct with this, and it's caused a lot of grievance for us to prove, <laughs> is that uh, you, so effectively it's a gradual change, you have 25 cycles, and 50 cycles, and 100 cycles, but it happens not instantaneously. So they ask why if you claim this electronic structure, uh, so, they obviously, the, the reason is what we have the solid state materials, but it's also the reason because we apply it, uh, so we produce so much hydrogen, so if we would apply higher current density in order to inject these electrons, so our materials would just fall off. And this is shows uh, how fast, uh, so if we uh, cycle to lower voltages, when we speed is much smaller. So it's the current density, the, the electron injection, which is, uh, causes the improvement. Again, this is proposal, so they are working this. So this is a very new and work in progress. So be very open to any criticism. Uh, if someone has something to say, they are very, very kind. We, we don't know at the moment, so. A lot of work. Well, so very, very interesting work. So uh, hopefully we'll get some continuing funding uh, for this. Okay. But what is cool about this? So we, as operators, by uh, if we had a range of the materials, so we can operate uh, or computer if we can program and run the script, then we can find maybe optimal condition then the materials doesn't fall off, and you have your activation still uh, happening. Okay, so the conclusions, so we can use the mimics. So this is the pure chemical way, very beautiful, very easy, very nice collaborative work. Uh, so we will continue this, obviously, so we'll try to see if we can play with this, so we can build much more interesting clusters, we can have three metals in a row, four metals in a row. So there's, you can uh, flog this horse uh, for a very long time. So it's, it's a very nice uh, continuous project. Uh, so polymorphism, uh, so this is, we uh, close this project because uh, all our sole goal was to, kind of, to demonstrate what polymorphism is really, really nice approach and it's genuinely uh, changing the performance so there are plenty of uh, polymorphic uh, materials available in the literature so this is something we are very keen to pursue and see if the different polymorphs would behave uh, differently and quite exciting uh, direction what we are looking very very 
uh, activity is the activation. So we look at different systems with uh, uh, limited success. So molecular theorize uh, has uh, the best performance. We found different systems which also show this, but not to this as much extent. So we still don't understand why is it happening. Uh, so it's still uh, puzzled, but this is at least this is how the science works. So if we knew the answers to everything, that would be nothing. To but I would be working in better. <laughs> okay, excellent. So acknowledgement. So uh, Jessica, oh right, uh, Jessica who did absolutely amazing work. So brilliant, uh, brilliant researcher. Uh, so James, who spotted this effect and persuaded me, so he was a project student in my group, so he started it, and then he's now a beach team. Uh, Roberta, uh, who initiated all this work, so she was, she's now graduated, or nearly graduated. And so, and all our collaborators. So, and thank you all for your attention. It's the size of a crystal, and we, 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 we don't use the exfoliation. We convert it directly. Yeah. So it's a it's, 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 it's direct but synthesis. It's not really thin layer, but we will, no? But it will, what will happen if you use exfoliated material? Uh, so we try, we, we, we make the films. So we remove the films from the, uh, from the electrodes. Then this is where we we, we, we write down. So we 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 pick up the molecular telluride, but still didn't check them. Didn't manage to check them. So it's the question how you attach them to electrodes. So we're thinking about it. So we can grow the uh, large films on molybdenum of molybdenum telluride on, on silicon silicon oxide. But silicon silicon oxide, you can't measure on silicon yeah. silicon oxide. So you need to take the entire film, transfer it on some substrate. So we are trying to this goal, but the problem you stick it into the, your acid and just it falls off. So it's the question of design, and we didn't come here with a good design. Uh, but but that's that's the goal. So we will see how it works on the way. Yes. Thanks. Questions now? So uh, very interesting this uh, bimetallic tungsten and the molybdenum compound. So they look uh, quite similar to this bi-inspired uh, hydrogenase, mm -hmm. uh, like yeah. based on iron, uh, nickel iron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. There, everybody, I think, playing with the metal center of the center of the world, right, to activate in hydrogen. So in your case, you... It's, it's a non-metal. I, I, I still, you think I still don't metal? believe it. <laughs> I I still, you think it's biological? Yeah, I, uh, that's why I want more, uh, more examples of molecules. I mean, you can calculate anything in a right. sense. So uh, it would be nice if someone tried to calculate them as well. So extra opinion would be very nice to, to have there. So uh, to me, it seems to be very unexpected. Yeah, I would ex so all electric catalysts, they all are metal centers. So we have nitride catalyst, electric catalyst, and purely metal centers. So it's very, very strange to me what catalysis is happening on non-metal. So that's why they currently try to produce selenium nanorocks to see if it uh, drops 
dramatically in performance or improves dramatically in performance. So if you have absolutely identical, and this is a beautiful thing about molecular materials because you have absolute control of our structure, you have single crystals, you know exactly what you do. Uh, so we don't know yet. But that's a very, very valid question. So I personally am uh, not sure. I, 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 I'm not entirely agree, uh, but we publish a nice paper, so there will be follow-up. Hopefully people will complain about this, so we'll have nice dialogue. Uh, so to, to me, science is about dialogue. To me, uh, if I'm wrong, so for me it's not about proving uh, myself right or wrong. It's about uh, trying to develop some very interesting uh, direction in research which we can pursue. As I said, we can work this field for a very, very long time. And this is this is great thing about this type of material. So you can continue producing many, many papers, many PhD students will finish their thesis. It's it's a it's a nice direction of research because the variety of uh, catalytic system you can generate where it's so it's 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 quite immense. And it's, 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 it's a great direction. I really like this project because it's a safe project. This is something that you give to project students. So, so any other questions? Yes. Time for one last. No. Okay. So looking. Uh, so you know, I mean, it's pretty your point that you are not that, that worried about being wrong or right. That, that you know, that last phenomenon you presented mm -hmm. that actually looks like you are transforming something. Not the structurally, mm -hmm. but some sort of you know gradual change in the oxidation state mm -hmm. of the metal, depending on how separate it is from the electric. This is what they're going to do. So they're going to do it. Yeah. So, so I have also. So, so we, that's what I would ask. So, mm -hmm. you. so we, we, we we also tried to to to. So one of the theories was my my bad theory was the hydrogen intercalation. So you can intercalate protons into into quite a few. But that's going to change. Chemical coordinates. That way to promote some yeah, 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 it's a change of oxidation yeah. state, so they sit, but, uh, but because we do it at the random yeah. XRD, you would see the split of the legs and they spot on. That's why you see the silicon there. Yeah. So the reason for silicon uh, in, in the slide, so why, this is why they have the silicon in XRD, is because it's, it's a reference. So you know for sure that your zero zero one peak stays there. So if you would have intercalation of hydrogen, the peak would move, and you will clearly see this. So yeah, yeah. So the dissolvers work where they intercalated in quite a few systems. So uh, I, I still think that. So my theory right now, so which is even more wicked than electronic structure, you have intercalation. You turn off the bias, this hydrogen immediately uh, runs away, and it's happening. That's why uh, relaxation is very, very fast. So, and that's going to be quite hard to prove. That's <laughs> really, really hard to prove. So, when I thought if you write in the paper, you give such an easy uh, out of jail card to, to, re to reviewers, they would be completely annihilated there because they will say, like, prove it. <laughs> No, we didn't risk it. So anyway, I mean, so Alex will be around for the rest of the day. So if anybody might be interested in the this, let me know. It's by my office, okay? So let's thank him again. So thank Alex.